sexual abuse is not just an American issue. It is a global issue. Anywhere where you see extreme poverty, I guarantee you there is an undercurrent of male sexual abuse that is happening to young boys. The truth is, I'm here today because I want to ignite a spark in you about this specific issue and trauma because this happens in cycles. I do this work not just only as a researcher, but as someone who has been closely affected by this myself. Once again, my name is Robert Marshall and I have the esteemed honor to be here with you this morning um, to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. It is my life's work. Um, I, like she said, I transitioned out of uh, higher education and the educational arena. And because of my amazing spouse um, who told me, Robert, quit your job and speak full time. And I'm like, what? What wife tells her husband to quit your job? And so here we, here we are. And so I'm so honored to be before you this morning. Um, and it's 8. Uh, wait, what, what time is it now? 8.30. So I'm on Central Standard Time. I'm from Chicago. And so it's still an hour early. I didn't have my Starbucks today. But we're here. All right. So let's, I, I want to start off by saying thank you for being here so early. But also, um, it is not my intent to trigger anyone or to uh, or, or to cause any harm. So I want to preface what uh, this talk with some of the information that you're going to hear. Um, they are the lived experiences of male survivors. These are people, uh, men who have uh, lived this, who have walked this, and who are on their journey to wholeness. Can you repeat this after me? Healing is the journey. Wholeness is the destination. Healing is the journey. Wholeness is the destination. That is the center, the bedrock of the work that we do with male survivors. And so about a couple of years ago, we started something called the Survivor Circle. And the Survivor Circle um, is a nonprofit organization now that was started to create a framework or a space for men in urban communities to journey to wholeness. One of the things to understand about male sexual abuse is that it is more of a socioeconomic issue than anything else. Research lets us know that uh, men or boys who come from underserved communities are 50% more likely to experience some form of sexual traumatic experience. Now for, the, for this conversation um, and in the work that we do, I have to be honest, I did not start out doing this because I wanted to talk about sexual abuse. I did not start doing this because I wanted to start an organization. I started doing this because I realized that there was a problem and for people who looked like me and came from where I came from, there was no solution. I want to ask you a question this morning. As social workers, as professionals, where do hurting and broken men go? I'll tell you, they go to an early grave or they go to prison. If we look at statistics, and many of you, you are, you are in this space, so I don't have to spew off and nerd out on you, but we understand that men in urban communities, brown, black, and I'm not just talking about in America, I'm talking about globally, because sexual, male sexual abuse is not just an American issue, it is a global issue. Anywhere where you see extreme poverty, anywhere where you see uh, classism, racism, any of those things, those systems in place, I guarantee you there is an undercurrent of male sexual abuse or sexual grooming or molestation 
or uh, prostitution that is happening to young boys. So I'm not just talking about uh, 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 America, I'm talking about India, I'm talking about Africa, I'm talking in Central America. These places, this uh, is a, a issue that boys and men have been carrying and carrying for decades and have been suffering in silence. And so out of that, we form the Survivor Circle, which envisions a world where every individual that is affected by sexual abuse is empowered to reclaim their voice, heal their wounds, and thrive in a compassionate and, uh, and understanding society. The Survivor Circle is a safe space. That's a popular word to use for many people, but when we talk about safe spaces, we're talking about a space that allows male survivors of sexual trauma to speak without reservation. It is a space that it is a space that allow that allows them and enables them to say what they are afraid to say. It's a space that enables them to heal and community and heal and brotherhood. And so our work is centered in research. And so what we've been doing over the last three, four years, we have been traveling to city after city doing grassroots work in urban communities in America, Central America, as well as Africa, talking to male survivors, building relationships with social organization, uh, social organizations, religious organizations, and we've figured out and we've, we've kind of put some things together um, and realized that there are some common themes that run through that male survivors of sexual trauma actually deal with globally. And so to the, now when we, I say this, healing is the journey, wholeness is the destination. I want to be very clear that wholeness looks drastically different for every person and their, their journey to wholeness their healing journey looks drastically different. And our work is not centered in, a, uh, is not centered in helping and uh, defining what wholeness looks like for an individual or what their healing journey looks like. But the beginning of creating a safe space is allowing them to journey to wholeness, but you and define their and define what wholeness looks like for them, and define what those healing steps looks like for themselves. Our job is to walk alongside them every step of the way, so they know that they are not journeying alone. And so the pillars of our work has to be, and when we do this work. It has to be centered in research. It has to be centered in advocacy and empowerment and education and safety. Because I've run, I've, a lot of us, we, you know, there are some statistics, some numbers out there that are very popular about male sexual abuse. We hear the numbers one in six um, boys have, or one in six men have experienced some form of sexual traumatic experience. But as a researcher, and, and I've realized in doing this work that a lot of the research that in the numbers and the statistics that we hear and we see around male sexual abuse and trauma does not include boys and men in urban communities. It does not include them, number one, because the key word to statistics and data, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, somebody has to do some reporting. And last time I looked at the news, last time I looked at the state of America, last time I looked at urban communities, not in America, but around the world, we see that these communities do not have great relationships with police officers, law enforcement. We have seen that laws are interpreted based upon privilege and based upon financial income and who you know. Um, and so I often when I stand before men in environments, whether I'm standing in a prison, whether I'm standing in a school, whether I'm standing in a religious community, I can ask, I typically ask this question. How many of you have reported anything to the police? And when I'm talking to men, most of the time, more, almost 80% of the room raise their hands because of cultural understandings of what happens in this house. And what's happening in the houses has continued to contaminate and harden the hearts of men. 
And so these men carry the weight of their pain, their trials, their hurt, and, their, and they, carry the, they carry the guilt and the shame of their abuse that does not even belong to them. I often say this about male survivors. It's like, after you have an entire, let's say you have a long day of work, you just have a long day. So I have three kids, I have a wife, I have a business, I have other things. You know, at the end of the day, when you just don't want to talk to anybody, you are peopled out. Do I have any introverts in here? Where, you know, where you're people, you, you just got, you can't talk anymore. You're just like, do not talk to me. <laughs> after you have answered passive aggressive emails, after you've dealt with uh, clients and patients that think that you're the next best thing to their savior and you're supposed to create a miracle, um, after, you know, experience, after they've eaten bad things all their life, after they've done stuff and now you're supposed to come in and save the day? Can somebody say amen? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And so you're just supposed to be Mr. and Mrs. Fix-It when they take no responsibility for their actions. That is what it's like being a male survivor of sexual abuse every day of your life. Before you wake up in the morning, you are contending with shame that does not belong to you. You are contending with guilt that you do not understand. You're still trying to frame what happened. And most information and most research shows us that most male survivors in urban communities, guess what? They don't even understand and realize that they are a victim, and I hate using that word, but for this context, I'll use it. They are a victim of sexual abuse or sexual trauma. Why is that? I'm glad that you ask. I'm getting in my flow now. Um, I'm, they don't realize it because number one, in urban communities worldwide, when a boy is introduced to sex prematurely by a woman, it is seen as an introduction to masculinity and manhood. It is more, if a boy is introduced to sex prematurely um, or sexually abused by a male, you know, that's more taboo and we just don't talk about it. So when a boy is introduced to sex prematurely, he is given a clap on the back. But if it was a little girl, we would have problems. Most of us would have problems. But it is so culturally embedded within society that we have names for it. Women are called cougars. They're called sugar mamas instead of being called rumors and rapists. And so little boys think they're owning grown man stripes, not realizing it's like putting an AK-47 in their hand and committing mass genocide to everyone who comes in their path. In order to understand this work, number one, I said we have to do some research. We've got to do some digging, all right? Now, I'm about to, I'm going to try not to read all of these stats to you because that's not the right way to speak, right? That's what we know. You don't read all the stats. But I want you to know that this is a problem. I want to read some, a, a couple of things. That men die by suicide 3.7 times more often than women. 88% of men who are currently in prison grew up in fatherless homes. More male victims are assaulted by multiple, which means two or more assailants, than females suggesting gang rape. Common symptoms for sexually abused men include guilt, anxiety, depression, interpersonal isolation, shame, low self-esteem, self-destructive behavior, PTSD reactions, poor body imagery, sleep disturbance, nightmares, anorexia or bulimia, relational and sexual dysfunction, and compulsive behaviors like alcoholism, drug addiction, gambling, overeating, overspending, and sexual obsession and compulsion. I know we know no men like that. Because the truth is about male sexual abuse, it is, it's not something that just happens. It's not something that just is a once in a you know, blue moon thing. The statistic is one in six by, but by way of our work and our research, we believe it's more like three, in six, three out of six. 
And no matter what book you read, no matter what research you see, everyone will tell you, especially in urban communities, there is no clear number because we don't say anything. We don't say anything, but just because we don't say it does not mean we don't feel it. And you know the ones who get the shorter end of the stick most of the time is the people that love them the most. It's their mates, it's their children, it's their significant others. It is the people that love them the most that tend to get hurt the most. I say this, that oftentimes male survivors of sexual trauma go through life not understanding what has happened to them and they carry the guilt and the shame that does not even belong to them. What is it like carrying gain? Uh, what is it like? What does it feel like carrying a guilt and a shame that does not belong to you? Questioning the divine, questioning their existence, questioning how could I have changed this? How? Why didn't I fight? Why am I not strong enough? Why? And when they tell their stories, then their stories. Are, are judged by those who are listening. And then it is those that are listening that take on the, uh, the seat of judge and juror to decide whether what they're saying is valid or not. According to research, boys are most vulnerable between the ages of eight and 12 with the median age of nine and a half. Research has shown that uh, one in 20 youth have, ex have received an online sexual solicitation in which the solicitor tried to make offline contact with the individual. It is estimated that approximately 71% of child sexual offenders are under 35 and knew the victim at least casually. About 80% of these individuals fall within normal intelligent ranges and 59% gain sexual access to their victims through seduction and enticement. The difference between uh, a, a girl being sexually abused and someone who identifies as a boy and a man is that oftentimes the person that sexually abuses or grooms a boy is not a stranger on the street. It's not somebody who's in a van who's looking to, to just sweep them away and traffic them. Now that does happen in urban context. But typically it is somebody who has gained the trust of the student, of the child. It is somebody who has gained the trust of the parents and who has groomed not only the student but also has groomed the parent as well. Making it okay for them to be alone with the child. Making it okay in front of the parent to be able to physically touch the child. And so that when they strike or when they choose to, uh, to uh, go through with their abuse, the child is confused because this is someone who is supposed to be safe. When we look at our stories and our work, we have seen that it is most of the time uncles, fathers, grandfathers, aunts, mom's friends, aunties, who often introduce boys to sex prematurely or, 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 or experience or cause some type of sexual traumatic experience for young boys. And don't let me leave out priests and preachers too. So what do you do when your abuser and the person that is supposed to be protecting you is wearing the same uniform? What do you do when the people who are supposed to be praying for you wind up praying on you? Where do you go? The truth is, most men, like I said earlier, go to an early grave and are incarcerated. Have we ever looked and asked the question, why is over 50% of a population behind bars? 
Why is it that men are dying from alcoholism, dying from drug addiction, suicide? And it's almost as if nobody has a solution. There, in our research, we have found there is a string, and you guys let me know how much time I have left, if there's a clicker or timer, because I will talk. <laughs> in our research, we have found that there is a string, a silent string, a small string that screams loud, almost like an echo. It strings from the um, disadvantaged home, the single parent home, it travels to the, to the dropout rates in school, retention rates in school, it travels to the school to prison pipeline, then it travels to gang violence, black on black crime, black on white crime, brown on brown crime, brown on black, all crime, and then it goes into the prison system and the same string travels to and to our recidivism rates. How do I know? Because I've done the work. I've stood in all of these spaces and asked the same question. How many of you have experienced some form of sexual traumatic experience or have been exposed to sex prematurely and almost every time I don't even think I have to say the rest but almost every time it's more than the majority of the room there was a quote that said that it's easier to raise strong boys than to heal broken men but my question is, what happens to the men? Because this is not a them problem. This is an us problem. Them, those are our husbands. Those are our fathers. Those are our politicians. Those are our preachers. Those are our professors. Those are our uncles. Those are our nephews. If we look in our families, we will see, and I guarantee you there is somebody in your family that has experienced either some form of sexual traumatic experience or has been introduced to sex or sexuality prematurely. And they don't say anything because they're afraid. They don't want you to know that they struggle with pornography. They don't want you to know the thoughts that go through their minds, the war that they have to fight before they go to Starbucks and get their coffee. So they are carrying the weight of the world, a pain that does not belong to them, a shame that does not belong to them. And then they go into a workplace and work with people who demean them and demand them. They listen and they answer passive aggressive emails. They walk in meetings feeling like they're the smart, that the, the, they are the smallest thing in the room. And now they have to compete. And when others are trying to show them up, all they're trying to do is survive. Our hope and framework for facilitating the journey. I want you to say this with me. Healing is the journey. Wholeness is the destination. In our work, we've come together to share our lived experiences of sexual trauma. And as survivors, we started the Survivor Circle and the Echoes Movement because we were tired of the shame and guilt and being bullied by our own experiences. We exist to help survivors to journey to wholeness one healing step at a time. Now you've heard me say that a lot, but our, what, is that, what does that practically look like for us? 
Number one, that all of our work centers on three kind of core guiding directions. And when you go back to your organizations, your entities, maybe you can adopt this when you start working with boys or male survivors. Number one is that everything we do centers around humanizing the lived experiences of male survivors of sexual trauma. Humanizing the lived experiences of sexual, male survivors of sexual trauma. Number two, creating safe spaces for male survivors to journey to wholeness. And number three, empowering those who love and support them with the tools needed to be and do it well. Now I could go into depth in each one of them because we have booklets for all three of them. Until we see male sexual abuse as a human problem, we won't see it as a problem. I, oft, I said that there was a quote that talks about it's easier to raise strong boys than it is to heal a broken man. But our philosophy is that if you heal the broken man, that broken man then heals his family. And then that healed family creates a space to heal communities. And then that community, if we can heal a community, for sure we can heal the world. But it happens one step, one moment, one story, one man at a time. And the truth is this work, this sounds a lot prettier than the work, than actually doing the work. Because at the end of the day, if there's not a grant, if there's not a budget, if there's not private funders, how can you do it? Because all of the money goes to women and children. So how do we create the spaces? So we have, we, we ask ourselves these questions like, how in the world can we do this work when there's a lack of time, when there, I know bro, we hear you. A lack of time, a lack of resources, a lack of energy is that we have to go back to the powers that be. We have to listen and we have to allow the data to speak for us. Oftentimes when trying to do this work, we lean on qualitative data. And so we like to hear the stories, but that means we, act, we actually have to start putting some money and budget toward quantitative data, research, trends, measuring and seeing how this issue is impacting our societies, our educational systems, the judicial system, heck, every system. We have to go back to the powers that be and say we need to make this a priority. And what I can guarantee you is that when you put the money towards healing the man, the broken and hurting man, you can begin starting to heal broken and hurting children and communities. We empower men to tell their story. I wanna share, and can we do a little exercise here? I wanna share a video with you. And I would like to hear some of your responses and how this video made you feel.
Can I have a few individuals who don't mind sharing while watching the video, what did you feel? What did you see? How did, what, what was your initial reaction? You would never be able to pick them out in the crowd. They were just like anybody else. They, they everyday men. Um, they're students, they're professionals, they're priests, they're preachers. Um, you wouldn't know what they experienced because they just everyday guys. What else? How did it make you feel? What, what was your initial reaction? I felt like um, perhaps they were feeling more comfortable and like less um, exposed as they were able to, right, because they were putting more clothes on, but um, just the, like, the way that that feels inside as opposed to like with clothing, like just the deeper sense of, of being part, like covered with, with the clothes, but then part of the community as you're putting more on and, and being um, just more with your people and, and comforting, more comforted. Thank you. Who else? Yes. I was watching those men stare directly into ca camera, um, undressed, and it would seem that they're just stoic and some look confident, but I know personally and I felt their shame and I felt um, even down to things like body image issues that people expect men not to have. Um, the things that they were feeling that people expect men not to feel, I could see them feeling those things and I started to feel those things. Uh, when I saw the video, before they started putting the clothing on, I started feeling like there was a unity amongst the black men. You know, you didn't know who they were, but as they started to put on their clothing, you can see their uniform. You just, before that, you just knew they were men. You didn't know what it was or what they, what they were doing specifically. Did anyone feel uncomfortable? By show of hands, how many felt uncomfortable? How many of you were like, what in the world has this turned into? <laughs> the truth is, they felt all of those things. They felt empowered, but yet frightened. Each one of those men in that video is either a survivor of sexual trauma or a serious advocate because someone they loved is a survivor of sexual trauma. But why do we do this? We do this because there's an African proverb that we center some of our work around. And it is, until the lion learns to speak, the tales of hunt will always favor the hunter. And can I submit to you, every male that is behind bars, the hunter is telling the story. Every boy and every male that is in the grave prematurely, the hunter is telling the story. But what would they say if they could speak for themselves? What would they say? How would they ask for help? How would they get help? before their life was snatched away from them? What would it look like if they met a you or me before they got behind bars and realized that there's help and that they don't have to live in shame and guilt? The truth is, I'm here today because I want to ignite a spark in you about this specific issue and trauma because this happens in cycles. It is systemic and we see the effects of these cycles in every system that serves or interacts with males in urban communities. The truth is, one of my good friends said this, everyone has a spark that can turn into a flame if you ignite it. I want all of us to be ignited. Not just about women and children. They matter, believe me they do. But men matter too.
I do this work not just only as a researcher, but as someone who has been closely affected by this myself. Can I read an e a couple of excer excerpts and a couple of stories for you? Is that okay? I want to make sure this may be triggering to some of you, so to someone. So if it is, feel free to walk out the room if you need to. But the truth is, this is our lived realities. And I have to be honest, even reading it sometimes is hard for me. But he walked me around and he walked me around the abandoned building and showed me every room. From that moment to this day, I don't remember how it happened. But the next thing I remember is getting put on a square table in a small room and him inserting himself into me. I remember him gripping my, my 11 year old head and pushing it towards his persons to perform oral sex on him as a former abuser taught me. And I remember the discoloration and the curvature of his erect persons. After he was finished, he said, you liked that, didn't you? After responding, I don't know, he looked at me in disgust and told me something that shook me. You need to go pray. Something is wrong with you. That's a spirit of perversion that you need to get rid of. He said as he buckled his belt. As an 11 year old boy experienced pu experiencing puberty, his words echoed a depth inside of me that his persons would never be able to penetrate. I felt nasty, ashamed, and maybe worst of all, I thought that it was my fault. My experiences with the preacher continued for eight whole years from the age of 11 until I was almost 19 years old. He would pick me up under the pretense of being my bigger, me being his younger little brother and would take me to random places to have sex. No location was off limits. We had sex on park benches, pool houses, under trees, the gym, and restaurant bathrooms. This is a story of someone else who you'll hear from later on today. His name is Ronald McCray. He's an amazing individual. Ronald's story, he pins this. My first time abuse occurred, I remember laying on the floor in the living room. My relative's friend came to the house where we were and popped in a black VH tape, VHS tape that changed my life. There were no more blinders on me at this point. I watched an adult man and woman have sex and it wasn't, it wasn't so much what I saw that changed my life. It was the actions that followed. The relative and his friends began to masturbate as they watched the film and I suddenly became the subject of their curiosity. As I was lying down on my stomach, one of the guys came down to where I was and pulled my pants and underwear down. He pulled down his as well, laid his naked body on mine, began to attempt to enter himself into me and continually rub himself against me. I laid there still and afraid, yet I felt safe and secure. After the experience, I ran to the restroom and began to cry. I washed my body with a rag in intensely, hoping to remove the feelings of guilt and shame and the smell of his body off of me. On another occasion, they took turns touching me, making me, turn, making me touch them and making me compare their anatomy as I was naked on the bed. One of them got into the bed, turned me over and began to hump his naked body against mine. At other times, this relative forced me to perform sexual acts on others at knife point. He did, he did and said so many cruel, traumatizing things to me. I don't know how long the abuse lasted, but it set me down, it set me down a self-destructive path. There were times I wanted to die because of the pain I felt inside. I had even come close to ending it all on more than one occasion. My heart shattered into pieces and nothing or no one I did seemed to heal the hurt inside. If God didn't save me at the age of 22, I would have lost my entire, I would have lost my life, myself entirely by now or possibly even have taken my life. I'll read one more that's not so. That night, I can never forget. I tried, I, I, I tried shaking off the sound. 
I tried shaking off, the, uh, shaking off the sound of the scream from my memory, but somehow they made their way to my heart. I sat there on the edge of my bed, rubbing my hands together, thinking, listening, thinking to myself, this is a modern day hell where life has no boundaries. Everyone does as they please. And this is Christopher Boulder in context, he's in prison. If I ever was to live at its depth, this was the moment. I hope someone was bold enough to get up and stop it, but no one did. We all listened. We all wondered who it was and how it would, and how it would end without guards intervening. After pleading for help, I heard the predator telling the victim countless of times to shh. At that very moment, that word hit me differently. I'm still trying to forget the pain of that night that all 63 men heard the same sounds as I did. The same man who could barely walk out of that shower afterward was escorted out. Moments later, I stepped into that shower and was curious and I decided to understand. And I needed to understand. The bathroom looked like a crime scene. Blood splattered everywhere as it dripped into the shower drain. No one said anything. Half the guys went back to sleep. I'm rolling out of bed every morning reminded of the scars and the broken fingernails from fights I lost and those I barely won. Still the one thing I can't forget is the sound of the man screaming for help while he was violated. I can't forget the haunting sounds of hearing a man screaming for help from being assaulted while being told to shh, shh, it's not even a word. It's an interjection of an expression that speaks of its own culture of demise. Shh, while I strip you of something you'll never share. Shh, while your pureness gets replaced for a wound of secrets, a word that doesn't even exist. It haunts the souls of sexually abused individuals, but today they live to tell the story replacing their trauma with a dilemma of freedom that no secret will ever hold. I don't have enough time to go through this whole entire presentation. But can I ask a question? Do you feel me? This is heavy. But this is the weight that men carry every day of their life. I could talk about helping men and understanding and what uh, I can talk about understanding their journey but oftentimes it is the abused men who suffer in silence and never get help but if I can leave you with this as you do your work and you start to kind of do and I challenge you to do your own research part of helping men journey to wholeness is understanding the journey and oftentimes men get judged prematurely because of self-sabotaging behaviors that they adapt in order to cope with a pain that they don't even know how to define. I'll say this. These are just some things to understand what this journey may look like. Some men choose to try to alter their realities. Other men live in denial. Some men just plainly give up. And instead of going through life, they allow life to happen to them. Some, they blame themselves, thinking if they could have done something different, then it wouldn't have happened. Some men choose to isolate themselves and use this as a defense mechanism. Other men, they choose to fight blindly. Some men, they result to anger. Others respond by spiritual elitism, hiding behind religious beliefs, choosing not to do, but, and let me preface this with saying, hiding behind their spiritual beliefs, but using it as a cloak to cover up their trauma, which hinders them from doing the work, from healing what's underneath that cloak. Some men 
They choose to redefine what happened to them and define that redefine their entire existence because abuse and male sexual trauma does not fit within our socioeconomic or cultural understanding of maleness, masculinity, or manhood. Our little boys will one day become grown men. And broken little boys become broken and hurting men. But it's gonna take people like you and me realizing that this is an issue and this is something that we need to really delve into because men matter too. I want you to repeat these words half with me. Healing is the journey. Wholeness is the destination. You can't heal a man, but you can journey to wholeness with him one healing step at a time. Thank you.